So there's a lot of context to go about uh, today. So I got, you know, a little bit of uh, to bring you up to speed. Jesus, the son of God, became man being born of the Virgin Mary and preaching that the kingdom of God is at hand while proving it through signs, miracles, healings and teachings. This was This has created a stir among the Jewish religious leaders because although the Old Testament scriptures they had at the time did mention a coming Messiah and Savior that would come in grace and ruling, this Jesus only came with mercy and grace in his first coming to earth, saving his ruling and reigning till the second coming talked about in the book of Revelation. Either way, the religious leaders did not like what Jesus was saying. Yeah, well, that he was God, because even if he was God, and we believe he is, that would seem to undermine everything the religious leaders had built up with the temple and the sacrifices with what Jesus was preaching. More specifically, so far in Mark chapter 14, Jesus had been anointed for burial while he was still alive, had Passover with his disciples, which institutes the practice of communion together. Judas left to betray betray Jesus to the religious leaders. Jesus described how Peter would deny knowing Jesus three times like the rest of the disciples that would scatter before daybreak. Jesus' disciples went to Gethsemane to pray, and although Peter, James, and John couldn't stay awake through the night, Judas came back with a multitude of swords and clubs to take Jesus to the religious leaders. And then Peter drew the sword, cut someone's ear off, Jesus rebuked him, and healed the person's ear, which in my opinion protected Peter from being also crucified as an assassin or accomplice. Mm -hmm. All this happened in one day, and it is the same night as we begin in verse 53 today. So let's go ahead and see if I can use the slide system like normal. Ew. Is this verse 32? Oh, rat row. A rat row. Well, I will go through the slides to just double check that it's not the second half that have been changed. No, they have some intro slides. Well, I guess you won't have any visuals today to read along, but I will be able to read along from the New King James Version in my notes. So hopefully you're okay with that. So, uh, verse 53. And they led Jesus away to the high priest. And with him were assembled all the chief priests, the elders, and the scribes. But Peter followed him at a distance, right into the courtyard of the high priest. And he sat with the servants and warmed himself by at the fire. So I'll go ahead and start with that. So I'll do shorter verse. Uh, probably two verses at a time since we don't have them displayed. Uh, it's kind of suspicious that the court that was ready was ready to judge Jesus at night instead of waiting till the next day to judge him during daylight. Normally, courts will like to meet during the day because then the public can sit in and see what's being decided publicly. And also, you've got the the fact that people don't like doing night shifts. So... That makes this a pretty suspicious court case going on. Uh, This is, by the way, the first of six legal confrontations that Jesus had to go through. The first three ended up being Jewish, with Annas, Sapphias, and the Sanhedrin. And the second three were Roman, Pilate, Herod, and then Pilate again. Pilate tried to pass the buck to Herod because Herod was the head of the galley. But Herod was smarter than than to deal with this giant situation, like cultural situation among the Jews. And so he passes it back to Pilate. Pilate tries everything as an administrator uh, possibly could do to get out of this trial because it's just so messy. And what's kind of crazy is if you go do a really in-depth study and there are books about this, all these different legal cases were, were not legally performed because they all did something that was against the law uh, through their uh, proceedings. 
Now, when Peter is following him at a distance, although Peter was told he would deny Jesus, I will give him credit that he was doing his best not to scatter away from Jesus. And I think we should be as desperately clinging to Jesus, even in the hard times, too. So I'll go ahead and move on to verses 55 and 56. Now the chief priests and all the council sought testimony against Jesus to put him to death, but found none. For many bore false witness against him, but their testimonies did not agree. So, surprisingly, the religious leaders are still looking for a way through the court system to put Jesus to death. I wonder if that's to save face or to look just in the eyes of the people. You know, the religious leaders already admit that they had been doing pretty murderous things when they, when Judas threw back the silver he was given to betray Jesus. Well, I guess he hasn't, they haven't already, but they will admit later that when Judas throws back the money, the silver for betraying Jesus, he, uh, they will say, this is blood money, so we can't donate it to the church kind of thing. And so they realize everything that's going on is a murder. I'm surprised they didn't try to murder Jesus outside of the court system. But my guess is that the Pharisees, you know, and the religious leaders feared the people more than God. They feared maybe the rumors that would be spread that the religious leaders were the ones who sent the assassin. And so they wanted it to be an official court case, even though this court case would be not held legally or done in a legal manner. It's even more suspicious, obviously, that uh, they tried to find so many witnesses that they found people who would bear false witness or lie about Jesus. And you can tell that they're lying because their testimonies did not agree, agree. And it's crazy to think like when you take someone to court and you are trying to do a court case unjustly it's not it's rarely to put someone to death but the goal of these witnesses was to put him to death this just keeps getting from bad to worse in my opinion so for a legal jewish case you always needed two or three witnesses that agree This was specified in Deuteronomy 17.6, which is part of the Torah. So, you know, the first four books of the Bible is what the Torah is, and they were highly revered by all the Jewish leaders. So I just wanted to emphasize to you that they were disobeying, you know, well, that if they didn't have two witnesses that agree, they could not be... Uh, charge these things against Jesus. And, you know, in the end, they don't even have two witnesses. They only have Jesus saying that I am, which we'll find in the next verses. So they still don't even follow their own law. Anyways, let's go ahead and read verses. I'll go ahead and read verses 57 and 58. Then some rose up and bore false witness against him, saying, We hope. Heard him say, I will destroy this temple made with hands, and within three days I will build another made without hands. So uh, that's verses 57 and 58. Although Jesus did say that previously, the Gospel of John describes Jesus' intention by saying this. So John 2 verses 19 through 21, I'll quote here. Jesus answered and said to them, destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. Then the Jews said, it has taken 46 years to build this temple, and will you raise it up in three days? But he was speaking of the temple of his body. Therefore, when he had risen from the dead, his disciples remembered that he, what that he had said this to them, and they believed the scripture and the word which Jesus had said. So, just to remind everyone here, this is the same Jesus that often spoke in parables. For example, when a girl was dead, Jesus would call her sleeping, as if it were a synonym. 
in the same way he was using the word temple to refer to his own body. Jesus even clarified that the one that is greater than the temple is here uh, in uh, you know, another part of the Gospels. <sighs> so, going on to verses 59 and 60. But not even then did their testimony agree. And the high priest stood up in the midst and asked Jesus, saying, Do you answer nothing? What is it these men testify against you? Okay. Jesus did many of these things. <laughs> Let me rephrase that. Jesus did many things publicly. 5,000 people were fed with a few fish and some bread. People were healed of lifelong ailments that had become their identities like blindness and the inability to walk. Word gets around with evidence like this. And even if you were anti-Jesus, wouldn't a part of you go, maybe we should check out this claim? They couldn't even, these religious leaders could not even get there because they were so against Jesus. They said his works were for the prince of the devil. Jesus got pretty upset about that when they said that, just FYI. So I'll go ahead and read it, verses 61 and 62. But he kept silent and answered nothing. Again, the high priest asked him, saying to him, Are you the Christ, the Son of the Blessed? Jesus said, I am. And you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the power and coming with the clouds of heaven. Whew. So the other Gospels make it clear that Jesus was put under no oath in you know, what, what was what the high priest did in verse 61. That he was required to answer by the court system. So Isaiah 53, 7 point predicts that Jesus would keep silent previously. You know, remember how he, they kept asking him normally without oath and he would keep silent. Uh, Isaiah 52, 7 says exactly, he would was oppressed and he was afflicted yet he opened not his mouth he was led as a lamb to the slaughter and as a sheep before its shears is silent so he opened not his mouth i would like to point out that isaiah the book of isaiah is pretty well documented for being written before jesus's life because of all the research that has been done on the dead sea scrolls Feel free to look that up yourself, but it's just further evidence that the entirety of the Bible, both the Old Testament and the New Testament, is one cohesive bad package, and that what Jesus did was pre-planned way before his arrival on earth, and that everything ended up being in control of God. Uh, 1 Peter 2.23 makes note of Jesus' silence, saying, Who, when he was reviled, not revile in return when he suffered he did not threaten but committed himself to him who judges righteously uh and so now we get to go on to the big verse verse 62 where jesus says i am please please i beg of everyone here take note of this passage there are religions where Jesus is said to be just a great teacher who never claimed to be God in the Bible. I have personally had a friend tell me that. And you can point anyone who says those kind of things to this passage in Mark 14, 62, where Jesus claimed to be the I am. The same exact title that God gave himself to Moses at the burning bush in the Old Testament scriptures. And feel free to Google search Moses in the burning bush to see that. I, you know, Matthew 26, 64 has it phrased that Jesus says it like, you said it. And I'll quote that verse real quick. Jesus said to him, it is as you said. Nevertheless, I say to you, 
Hereafter, you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the power and coming on the clouds of heaven. So, Son of Man here is a messianic title given from Daniel 7.13. Messianic, or Messiah, is the name given to the person predicted in the Old Testament scriptures to save the nation Israel and who ends up providing a gift of eternal life or salvation to the entire world by being on the cross, dying on the cross, to pay the punishment of sin, which is death. What Daniel 7.13 says lines up what Jesus said almost exactly. And I quote, I was watching in the night visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man, coming with the clouds of heaven, he came to the Ancient of Days, and they brought him near before him. So Jesus is quoting probably that passage when he's saying, I am. We as Gentiles might miss that reference to the Old Testament, but the Pharisees and religious leaders come to our rescue by crucifying Jesus over this issue and pointing out that Jesus is pointing to Messianic you know, the, the title of being the Messiah, the Savior of Israel. So I'll go ahead and read on, on verse 63 and 64. The, 63. Then the high priest tore his clothes and said, What further need do we have of witnesses? You have heard the blasphemy. What do you think? And they all condemned him to be deserving of death. Whew. <laughs> I'm going to, again, reiterate, whenever in the Bible we as non-Jewish Gentile people are in danger of missing an important Jewish, Jewish cultural insight, the distress of the religious leaders clues us in. The Pharisees, char you know, the religious leaders charge Jesus with blasphemy because Jesus claimed to be the Messiah and God. Uh, blasphemy, the Greek term used here, has two definitions. For commoners, or universally, it is slander, detraction, speech injurious to another's good name. For religious contexts, specifically, it's imp impious and reproachful speech injurious to the divine majesty. This is the high priest talking, so it would be a religious context talking about uh, saying reproachful virtual speech against God. We'll go ahead and uh, talk also about how, you know how the high priest said, what further need do we have witnesses? I would think the high priest should have asked for some evidence if this was a normal court case. Like, Jesus, do a miracle in front of us. <laughs> but he didn't. This wasn't a normal court case. They weren't looking for evidence on both sides. They were working for evidence on only one. The high priest rending his clothes, and uh, I saw a hand, and I'll be free to answer questions after the service for Q&A or a hand emoji. Um, the high priest rending his clothes is an act of an emotional emphasis and was illegal for the high priest to do. Also, in the Jewish court, you could not testify against yourself, surprisingly. So, uh, you know, I hear a lot that the Jewish court system laid the foundations for American common law, and I think there are some protections against people testifying against themselves within the American common law. Just, but that's why I hear, I don't know enough about American common law to speak, because I'm not a lawyer, surprise, surprise. <laughs> Let us continue to verse 65 and 66. Then some began to spit on him, to blindfold him, to beat him, and to say to him, Prophesy! And the officers struck him with the palm of their hands. Now as Peter was below in the courtyard, one of the servant girls of the high priest came. And when she saw Peter warming himself, he he looked at him and said, You also were the Jesus of Nazareth. But he denied it, saying, I neither know nor understand what you are saying. And he went out on the porch, and a rooster crowed. All right. Apologies, I read four verses, actually, verses 65 through 68. 
but it made more uh if flows better that way there's uh matthew when we're talking about uh jesus being spit on and blindfolded and beaten matthew 26 68 makes the mocking even worse <laughs> you know uh, i quote saying prophesy to us christ who is the one who struck you man can you imagine what that would be like to have people striking you and you have the power to to show them by sending an angel to slice off their heads but he didn't do it as a lamb brought to the slaughter and to the shooters he did not fight back which is just goes to show that he, Jesus was the one that was in control, fully in control the entire time of not using his immense godlike powers at any moment when feeling so much human pain. Anyways, uh, things are off the rails here at this court case. Can you imagine being in this room, seeing the people spit, beat, and slap the accursed in a court case? I think in American history classes, there's some court case where people had a fist fight, but that was so extraordinary, they still teach it in history class. And so it's crazy to think that the accused was beaten so much. The, the beating people is illegal in the Jewish court system. Um, the court is supposed to protect the accused. Uh, the Now, when it Peter is approached by one of the servant girls, the high priest, the emphasis that the servant was a girl is probably shown to show how Peter was afraid to be associated to Jesus, even to someone who had very little power. Uh, you know, this is a servant. This isn't someone high up. This is a girl. Girls had a lot less power and authority in that culture, unfortunately. Um, but, you know, it's it's just kind of sad to see that Peter deny Jesus in front of anyone, let alone, you know, a servant girl. And when he, Peter denies knowing Jesus, I'm going to go ahead and remind us of what we read a month ago in Mark 14, verses 27 through 31. Oh, actually, do I still have 27? Nope. Ah, man, <laughs> so close. Uh, I might have, it was, uh, it was one sermon earlier than what the notes are, where the slides are. Anyways, verse 27. Then Jesus said to them, all of you will be made to stumble because of me this night. For it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. But after I have been raised, I will go before you to Galilee. Peter said to him, even if all are made to stumble, yet I will not be. Jesus said to him, Assuredly, I say to you that today, even this night, before the rooster crows twice, you will deny me three times. But he spoke more vehemently, If I have to die with you, I will not deny you. And they all said likewise. All right. So that's the context. And the rooster has crowed once already with Peter denying Jesus once. Well, let's move on to verse 69 through 72. I'll do four verses because, and these are the last four verses of the, set, uh, of the teaching today. And the servant girl saw him again and began to say to those who stood by, this is one of them. But he denied it again. And a little later, those who stood by said to Peter again, Surely you are the one of them, for you are a Galilean, and your speech shows it. Then he began to curse and swear, I do not know this man of whom you speak. A second time, the rooster crowed. Then Peter called to mind the word that Jesus had said to him, before the rooster crows twice, you will deny me three times. And when he had thought about it, he wept. Can you imagine how devastating it would be to be in Peter's shoes? 
You walked away from family and career for three years to follow someone who you thought was God and is God, yet willingly goes to die. Those next three days before Jesus resurrects and visits his disciples must have been torture. God, although knowing the disciples would fail, trusted them with these trials and these difficulties, knowing they would get back up again. As Proverbs 24, 16 says, For a righteous man may fall seven times and rise again, but the wicked shall fall by calamity. So I ask you, do you try to get up, up after setbox? Can God trust you with trials like he did with the disciples? So this chapter ends on a pretty intense note, you know? The, the you know, there's this Roman capture. There's the betrayal of Judas. The disciples fleeing, being brought into a rigged court from the get-go. Lies being told. Not even any evidence is considered uh, on for the, for the most part on both sides. Spitting, beating, slapping, mocking. Peter is denying Christ. I am looking forward to the resurrection, which we are going to celebrate that over the next few months because in, that means we can come to back to life as well. You know, and that's in Mark 16 and following. But I also look forward to the rest of Peter's story. He starts out here a bit of a loser. He, com you know, he committed to doing something he didn't do. He denied Christ, cursing and swearing. No man of God. But one of the reasons we are here in this church today is because of what God has done through Peter. He became one of the first pastors of the very first churches, leading to many, many churches today. God can take a broken, failure, swearing Peter that's in these verses we talked about and turn him into and bring him into his destiny, which becomes hope for me and you here today. Maybe you think you are no good. Maybe you just came back to church one last time and I trust that if you pray, God will heal you if you open your ass self up to him, you know? God letter tells Peter, feed my sheep and restores Peter. All the gospels keep Peter's denial and call the ministry. Yes, the resurrection is important, and that's covered by the gospels. All four books of the Bible testifying of what happened during Jesus' life. Also, the story of failure that Peter goes through and how God redeems it is so encouraging and important to every one of us. So I encourage you to hang tight because this, although this chapter ends abruptly, when we get to Mark 16, the story turns around for good. Uh, you know, and I just wanted to emphasize, boy, did Peter weep it's okay to weep god is okay. you know you're not we're not perfect we can weep with god you know he even talks about in the book of revelation with heaven that god wipes away every tear and so i don't know if tears are coming from the crying it could be tears of joy but god cares about you in every emotional state especially when you have come to a place of humbleness, humility, and brokenness before him. Because he loves encouraging and empowering people like that. I, before we judge, now some people here might judge Peter too severely, you know, saying, I wouldn't deny Jesus. I would get crucified with him if I had walked with Jesus for three years. But look in the mirror. How many times have we denied God and lost opportunities to witness to others? And I'm emphasizing this as to believers who are walking with Christ. Have we talked when we should be listening? Have we argued when we should have obeyed? Do we fight when we should submit? Do we sleep when we should be praying? In Peter, we see our, the same struggles we go through. We see ourselves. 
Peter apologized after this to Jesus, and, and, you know, which we'll read about. And after a private meeting with Peter in Luke 24, verses 34, and Jesus forgave Peter publicly in John 21. After the resurrection, Jesus says, go tell the disciples and Peter. You know, because to the other disciples, Peter might have lost his discipleship for denying in front of other people, whereas the other disciples could hide and not have to admit that they were, you know, to people that they, or not have to lie to people. So to me, Peter, even if the disciples thought he lost his discipleship, Peter got his discipleship reinstated in John 20, verses 21. Jesus' death was not an accident, I need to emphasize, but was planned before the foundation of the earth, with Adam and Eve being placed in a way where they would sin and need God to die for them in love. A God who is in control, by the way, like Jesus was in control of this whole circumstances. Um by not using his power selfishly to reduce the pain, to get back, to be angry at people. But he died in, as a sacrificial lamb for us all. So, so if God, who is in the control, when the foundations of his own earthly existence are crumbling on the cross, is a God we can trust when our own lives are crumbling. Cool? I know that was a lot. But this is, this scripture is a lot. God's word is a lot. God's word is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword. And I pray that you each would individually pray for God to reveal himself to you. And I think because the Holy Spirit is with all of you, that he will guide you and uh, give small, little, kind gestures God for you. Anyways, uh, I'm going to be hanging around after for an hour. If you have any questions, I'll be off on the side. And uh, uh, I hope you all stay to hang out and talk and socialize and meditate on the words today and read these scriptures today. And, uh, you know, I'm excited for all the fellowship and the building up of one another and encouraging each other we can have together after uh, this service ends. And I'm, I'm very impressed. I ended this uh, 20 minutes early. So, <laughs> fast sermon. I'll go ahead and close this out in prayer. Dear God, thank you so, so much for this teaching. Thank you so much that you can use so few verses to communicate so much. Thank you so much that you have given Peter as an example of a failure who we can look to and know that you can use us as failures for your kingdom as Christians. And also that you are fully in control, even when everything seems to be in despair, even to the people who walk closest to you like the disciples. We pray, God, that you would give us the faith the hope and the love to cling to you, even in moments of despair, even from in the midst of church hurt, even in the midst of uncertainties, even in the midst of, of confusion. We pray, God, that you would heal the hearts of everyone here and that you would reveal yourself to them here today and, your, or, and in the days and weeks and months to come. In your powerful, precious name, Jesus Christ, God the Father and Holy Spirit, amen.